I'm Jeffrey McCullough. I am chair of ASID New Jersey uh, Student Affairs Committee, which means that I am chair of ASID New Jersey Student and Emerging Professionals Week. And tonight we have some of our committee members here and we have our board president, Nada Alzubi, here with us tonight. And so I first wanna turn it over to Nada to say a couple of words of uh, welcome and thanks and all of that that she needs to share with everyone. Go all ahead, right, Nada. thank you, Jeffrey. Um, hi, everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, uh, peace be upon you all. Uh, we're in the month of Ramadan. Today is the first day we are fasting. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. And uh, thank you all for joining um, this important session um, for the student of the student week. And uh, I would like to give a special thanks for our panelists for accepting our invitation and joining us. Also would like to uh, give a big thank you for the student and emerging professional committee uh, committees uh, for putting this uh, great event together. Uh, I don't want to forget also our uh, chapter sponsor to thank our chapter sponsor, Gold Sponsors, um, Design NJ, and uh, Bronze Sponsors, Atlas Marble and Granite, and JNS by Stark. Also, I would like to thank uh, our Student Week uh, sponsors, Benjamin Moore, um, Cheryl Williams and Samuelson Furniture. Um, and without further ado, <laughs> Jeffrey, the mic is yours. All right. Um, I want to remind everyone that this is a four day um, uh, series of programs. We began yesterday um, at, with the showroom crawl and scavenger hunt in Paramus, going from Faro and Ball to the Kohler showroom to the Shade Store. Uh, to Porcelanosa, and then ending with Design Within Reach. It was a wonderful day in premise uh, yesterday. Today, we have uh, the NCIDQ and CID program. Tomorrow, uh, those of you who signed up by the deadline um, and are seniors who are graduating in 2023 and um, recent graduates, we are doing portfolio reviews. Those are already scheduled with the reviewers from three to five. And then tomorrow evening at six on Zoom, we have our keynote presentation. And this year, we're very excited to have Royce Epstein, who is the A&D design director for, Mo for Mohawk, uh, the international uh, flooring company. Royce is based in Philadelphia. And so our presentation tomorrow night at 6 p.m. will be virtual, just like this program. You can still register for that program if you would like to at nj.asid.org and then go to the events section. Saturday is an entire day of programming here at Berkeley College in Woodland Park, New Jersey, which is where I am tonight. Um, and the program begins at 10 a.m. Saturday with an industry partner spotlight and education session first, and then a catered lunch, and then a, a professional program at one o'clock about preparing to make the transition from student to professional, and then a program at 2.30 with three interior designers in New Jersey on designer philosophies and processes. You can still register for that program as well. That is all in person at Woodland Park, New, in Woodland Park, New Jersey at Berkeley College. Again, nj.asid.org. We also wanna thank our specific student week sponsors um, in addition to our chapter sponsors, which are Benjamin Moore, Sherwin Williams, Design NJ, and Samuelson uh, Fine Furniture. Tonight's program is one that we hope will be interactive. There are going to be opportunities for you to ask questions after each of the presenters. Uh, I'm sure you all are going to have questions. You can put them in the chat box and Carrie Newman who is on our, who is chair of the Emerging Professionals Committee is going to field those from the chat box and pose them to the um, presenter um, at the appropriate time. So you can put any questions in the chat box, but also if you think of something when we're at the live question time, you can feel free to also ask your question um, live. And in fact, I know some of you will be asking questions live. Um, each year we do this program um, because it is so very important. It is the mainstay of our programming during this week. 
Uh, the other programs we rotate in and out. This program we do every year. And that is because passing the NCIDQ exam and becoming a state certified interior designer fully demonstrates verifiable skills to practice interior design. Preparing for the NCIDQ and being on the path to CID elevates your career and the profession. Tonight, we have an esteemed panel that will share their tips and best practices for preparing for and taking the NCIDQ and obtaining CID status. In order of how they will present, I'd like to introduce first, uh, Matt Barish is the Government Affairs and Advocacy Director at Council for Interior Design Qualification, which is the CIDQ um, uh, part of the acronym. MJ Devino is a lecturer and coordinator of the CETA accredited interior design program at Kane University, as well as a registered architect in the state of New Jersey. And he has successfully passed the NCIDQ exam. Alice Brousseau Qatar is an interior designer at the Morristown, New Jersey office of the global design firm Gensler, and also recently uh, passed the NCIDQ. And then Diane Gote, who helms this program, is an award-winning interior designer with a long list of industry accolades and career highlights. She studied at Pratt and NYU. She's a past president of the ASID chapter of New Jersey, and she was elevated to the ASID College of Fellows, the highest honor given among members. For ASID New Jersey, Diane runs the NCIDQ prep program and our mentorship programs. The fascinating part to me as a, as a professor of professional practice um, at Berkeley College is that Diane was, was a part of the coalition that worked with state legislators, the AIA, and all of the interior design organizations in the state of New Jersey through four New Jersey governors to get legislation passed for what is now known as CID, Certified Interior Designer, which is a qualifier and appellation. And as a result, she became the first certified interior designer in the state of New Jersey. She is CID number 001. Um, we are so happy to have our panelists tonight, and now I turn it over to Matt Barish. Thank you, Jeffrey, and uh, thank you, everybody, for having me here today. I'm very excited to share more about the NCIDQ exam with you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you all see that? Okay, perfect. So... A little bit about what we're going to discuss today. I can move this out of my way here. Okay. okay, so here's a little bit of the agenda that we're going to discuss today. First, we'll talk a little bit about recent news with the examination. Uh, we'll talk about some basic exam information and things that you will need to know in order to take the exam. We'll go through the application process. We'll discuss uh, dates, deadlines, and application fees. Also going a little bit into how to study for the exam, how the exam is scored, and overall benefits of certification. Um, so we will, all, at the end of the presentation, we'll also review jurisdictional registration and talk a little bit more about you know, the professional organization. And so moving on, I'd like to start with just an overview of why NCIDQ certification is important. So as uh, Jeffrey and, uh, mentioned earlier, the NCIDQ certification is the industry standard, and it's considered the gold standard in interior design credentialing. The NCIDQ exam is the examination requirement and one of the three E's that we like to call it of the, qual the qualifications that you need to become a licensed professional in a state, the education, experience, and examination. No other interior design credential measures the health, safety, and welfare knowledge that you gain throughout the three E's. Um, and it helps to demonstrate to Jeffrey's point that you have a specific set of core competencies supported by that verified work experience and post-secondary education. It can be a differentiator for you throughout your career. You know, many firms require certification for promotional opportunities, senior positions within the firm, 
and helps you help set you apart from uh, the rest of your co uh, colleagues and cohort as that qualified, competent individual dedicated to professional success. Uh, NCIDQ certification represents your inclusion with a group of more than 35,000 certificate holders. Now that may seem like a lot, but uh, that is throughout the entirety of the life of the Council for Interior Design qualification through since the 1970s. So, you know, it's a pretty exclusive group with around a thousand very committed and dedicated people achieving this credential each year. And so that is definitely a association that you want throughout your professional career. The NCIDQ certification is also highly portable. So if your career takes you to different locations throughout the United States, the NCIDQ certification is recognized by nearly all regulated jurisdictions in North America. And so being certified can help ease the path by validating your, uh, your credentials and your competency in other regulated jurisdictions. It also, in the same way that it's a differentiator, it also allows you some other professional opportunities for that uh, other non-certified interior designers might not be eligible for. For example, to be considered for many government interior design jobs, you have to be NCIDQ certified. And of course it comes with that increased salary potential. Both ASID and IIDA have studied the impact of NCIDQ certification on professional compensation and found that it does indeed make a difference uh, in your professional compensation. So, and finally, because NCIDQ certification must be renewed on an annual basis in order to remain active and that continuing education requirement that comes with it, it shows that uh, to your employers, to the state, to the public, that you are committed to maintaining your knowledge of how to protect the public in your daily practice. So a couple of new things uh, coming out of CIDQ that will help make your uh, certification journey a little bit easier. Um, first, we have the NCIDQ Candidate Handbook. This is the primary source for information about the NCIDQ exam and provides individuals with everything that you will need to know and understand while going through the certification process. So candidates applying for and planning to take the NCIDQ exam should absolutely read this handbook and familiarize yourself with the policies and procedures outlined within. And that, of course, is available on our website. Next, we have remote proctoring. We all know that COVID-19 brought a lot of changes to our life and our, to our society. And now remote proctoring is one of those changes that CIDQ has had to embrace, um, which is, of course, an exam delivery method administered by ProMetric, uh, CIDQ's test delivery vendor, which provides candidates with the option of taking the IDFX or the IDPX exams in a convenient location, such as your home. You can still take the first, those two sections and a Prometric test center. And for now, the pro practicum exam is only available at Prometric test centers, but now you have the option of taking those two sections of the exam at home. And we'll go into the exam sections a little bit later. Um, and finally, changing work experience requirements. Um, currently, you need two years of work experience in order to be eligible to sit for the exam. And we'll go into eligibility requirements a little deeper in shortly. Um, but now we are requiring that those work experience hours be uh, satisfy certain uh, content buckets. So now you have to have minimum hours in contract documents, in professional practice, in six different uh, professional practice buckets that uh, your hours need to be cataloged in. That information is also on our website and shows exactly which buckets you need and how many hours you need in experience to qualify for the exam. Many of you are already satisfying those requirements but this is to ensure that all of our candidates have a more diverse experience and a more holistic experience, professional experience in professional practice before sitting for the exam. And of course, all that information is available on our website. So let's get right into the test. The NCIDQ exam consists of three separate sections. 
the IDFX, the fundamentals exam, the IDPX, the, the professionals exam, and the practicum exam. The IDFX is a multiple choice exam designed for graduating seniors, recent graduates, or individuals in the last year of a bachelor's or master's degree, uh, master's program seeking an interior design degree. You don't need work experience in order to take the IDFX exam, and it's more focused on the academic knowledge or, you know, quote unquote, book learning, uh, covering the routine information that you typically would have picked up in your academic environment. The next section is the PIDPX, the professionals exam. That too is a multiple choice exam designed for individuals with a minimum of two years of work experience and focuses on the practical application of the knowledge gained throughout your professional practice, throughout the application of your knowledge in actual work. Then finally, the practicum exam. The practicum exam is based on three case studies, a large commercial, small commercial, and residential multifamily case study that contains various question types like hotspot, drag in place, fill in the blank functionality rather than multiple choice. It doesn't require drawing, and it's not software specific. You only need to be able to use a mouse to take this section of the exam but each case study includes a series of resource tabs for reference like project description, floor plan, reflected ceiling plan, door and hardware schedules, lighting cut sheets, codes information. And so you will, and additionally, individual questions may contain their own ex exhibits of supplemental materials. So you'll have all the resources you need in order to be able to answer a question correctly with the practicum. But again, it is, you're looking at actual design plans and applying the knowledge that you gain in school and, in, and throughout your professional experience to answer these questions. Now, of course, you know, people are always interested in understanding how individuals perform on various sections. And so here are the passing rates for the uh, 2022 exam administrations. Um, I think this is just the spring, but uh, as you can see, the exam's not easy. Uh, the pass rate varies from anywhere between the high 40s and low 60s regularly. Um, but of course, you know, with focus and dedicated preparation, passing the exam is attainable. So next, I'm going to go into each section of the exam in a little bit more detail, starting with the fundamentals exam. And something I want everybody to be aware of is that the exam blueprints for all three sections of the exam are based on a practice analysis, which CIDQ completes every five years. And so those blueprints are available on the website and are an absolutely phenomenal study resource because they, they lay out in pretty good detail exactly what each exam section covers and how much of the exam is that content area. And this slide here is an, a, an aggregation of that blueprint content. So that's on the studying for the exam website on our uh, page on our website, take a look at that. Um, but of course, you know, we update the exam every five years. So changes tend to be evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Um, but, you know, questions tend to, the number of questions in any given bucket tend to flow up or down, but doesn't change dramatically from one period to the next. And so again, the IDFX exam is designed for graduating seniors or recent graduates. You can take the IDFX exam in your last year of your program, and it's designed to assess all of the academic knowledge that you gain throughout your post-secondary education career. Uh, the IDFX exam is all multiple choice questions, you have three hours to complete the FX exam, and it consists of 100 graded questions plus 25 pretest questions, which are ungraded. And you won't know which questions are the regular questions or the pretest questions. So do your best on all of them. But as you can see here, 
the IDFX covers a litany of important topic areas that you will learn throughout your education. Relationship between human behavior, design environment, life safety and universal design, professional development and ethics, construction drawings. These are things that, again, of course, and referring to the title, are the fundamentals of professional practice. And next we have the professional's exam. You'll remember that the professional exam is uh, designed for individuals who have at least two years of interior design work experience completed. And again, this exam is all multiple choice questions. Candidates have four hours to complete this exam. And there are 150 graded questions and 25 pre-test questions, which are ungraded. So a little bit more uh, to this uh, section of the exam than the fundamentals exam and you're only eligible to take it after you satisfy your two years of work experience requirement. And it tests on things like professional business practices, which of course you would pick up in actual uh, professional uh, practice, code requirements, laws, regulations, that's very important, especially in regulated jurisdictions such as, yourself, uh, such as New Jersey, uh, furniture fixtures and equipment, project assessment, um, and again, Take a look at the blueprints on our website. These content areas are even fleshed out even further in those blueprints, which will help you understand what you need to study on and help you focus your time and use it effectively. Finally, we have the practicum exam. The practicum exam is designed for individuals who have at least two years of interior design work experience included, just like the professional. Now the practicum has multiple different question types and I have a short video that I'll show you that will help you understand a little bit better what the practicum looks like. But you, you're dealing with questions like hotspot, drag in place, fill in the blank. Four hours to complete this section consisting of 105 graded questions plus nine pre-test questions for a total of 114 questions on the practicum. And again, not this, uh, this section is not software specific. It doesn't require CAD or Revit proficiency. And each scenario will include a series of resource tabs for reference, such as project description, reflected ceiling plans, NCIDQ codes, or rather the IBC codes from 2018. We use those on the exam now. Um, and so I have a short video that I'm hoping you'll be able to hear the audio on to show you a little bit more about the practicum. Now, Jeffrey, I'm looking at you. I'm look, looking for a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you can hear the audio. Wait, going back. All right. Need business training for communication, DEI, this Excel, is not the video, HR, this is leadership, an OSHA, or consistent. All right, good, here we go. Hello, the following video will demonstrate the key functionality of the practicum exam platform. The practicum exam includes three case studies, one for large commercial, one for small commercial, and one for residential. Each case study has 40 questions associated with it. At the beginning of each case, you're given the opportunity to review the case study. The case study and supporting resources will be accessible throughout the exam by clicking on the open case button that is attached to each question. Within that case study, there are six tabs, the programming requirements tab, a floor plan, the lighting specifications, the NCIDQ exam codes, a conversion equation table, and a help tab that will be available throughout the exam to review the functionality features if need be. When a question, exhibit, or case study does not fit on a single screen, you will need to utilize the page scrolling function. To scroll through the screen, click and drag the scroll bar as necessary. When referring to the resources provided in the case studies, you are able to do a single keyword search 
for search within that resource. It is important to note that the search function will locate a term as often as it is used in the document. Therefore, it may require several clicks to get to where you want to be. You may also adjust the size of the different resources within the case study to move the whole case study to a different location on the screen if desired. To move from one question to the next, you should click the next button displayed at the bottom of the screen. To move to the previous page or question within a case study, click the previous button. As you go through the exam, you are able to mark a question for a review by clicking on the Mark for Review button. At the bottom of the screen, you will be able to revisit these questions at the end of each case study. You cannot, however, go back to a question in a previous case once it has been completed. You will be responsible for managing your own time. If you break down the three case studies into equal time frames, that is approximately one hour and 20 minutes on each case study. The amount of time remaining for the examination is displayed at the top right hand corner of the screen. A warning message is displayed when there is 15 minutes remaining on the exam. There is a note function that can be found in the top navigation area for every question on the exam. To add a comment for a specific question, click on the notes button. The note will be saved for that question only and can be reviewed when returning to that question. During the exam, you will be able to highlight or strike through text in a question that you think is important to refer back to. To highlight or strike through text, click and drag the mouse cursor over the desired text. Click on the highlight button or the strike through button on the top navigation bar. To remove the highlight or strike through, click on the same buttons and select remove. Note that the highlight or strike through feature cannot be applied to background images, case studies, or exhibits. A calculator is available with every question on the TAP navigation. The calculator can be used to perform any standard operation for which a handheld calculator is used. The calculator performs basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. If preferred, a handheld calculator can be requested from the test center administrator when checking in to take the exam. Now that the functionality of the exam platform has been reviewed, let's look at the functionality of the different item types on the practicum exam. There are three different types of questions that appear on the practicum exam. These question types are drag and place, hotspot, and fill in the blank. We will demonstrate these different item types using the exam platform. First, we'll look at how a drag and place item functions. For drag and place items, you will be asked to select a symbol, label, or dimension from the box on the left by clicking on the token or label you wish to move. Drag the token and release it when the appropriate spot has been identified. Be as specific as possible in placement of the label. Double check answers before moving on. If you want to select a different token, you are able to put it back and make another selection. The next question type is called hotspot. For these question types, you will be asked to place the target on a specific location within the image. When the location has been determined, click to drop the target. Targets can be moved again if you are not satisfied with your answer. The last question type is called fill in the blank. For these question types, you will be asked to provide a numerical response. In some instances, an exhibit will be attached to a question. The exhibit might be necessary to answer the question. Therefore, exhibits should be open to determine if they are needed. You are unable to zoom in on exhibits. However, you can move them to another location on the screen. Only a number is appropriate when answering these questions. Words or symbols will not be accepted and will generate an error message. Once all questions are completed in the case study, you will be given an opportunity to review that set of questions. All questions, only those marked for review, or incomplete questions can be reviewed when you get to the review screen. It is important, however, to keep an eye out on the timer to ensure not too much time is spent on the review process. Once a case study is completed, you will not be able to access it again. 
When you get to the end of the exam, you will click on exit and that will end the exam. These are the key functionality features of the practicum exam format. Good luck on the exam. Once you meet with a TurboTax expert, who will do your taxes for you? That was my colleague Cornelia going into a little bit more detail about the practicum exam. And next, we will talk a little bit about eligibility paths. Uh, now, meeting CIDQ's education and work experience requirements doesn't guarantee that a candidate will meet their jurisdiction's requirements to be a, a certified interior designer. And I'm sure uh, Diane will go into that a little bit more later. So, but you will definitely want to double check to ensure that you're, by being NCIDQ certified, that you satisfy the requirements for being a CID and that there are any additional uh, requirements for for that registration. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure Diane will be very thorough with that, about that next. But in order to sit for the NCIDQ exam, you have to meet education and work experience requirements. Now, again, for education, we require 60 semester or 90 quarter credit hours of post-secondary interior design coursework. Many of you, I'm sure, are already on the path to satisfy that, that uh, requirement, but it can be satisfied in a number of different ways, be it a bachelor or master's degree, CETA or not CETA accredited, uh, an architecture degree, or even an associate's degree, provided, again, that you meet that 60 semester credit hour threshold. Not all associate degree programs offer that, and you might have to supplement if you're in a program that doesn't with additional education. But as long as you hit that 60 semester credit hours of interior design coursework that encompasses a degree, you are eligible from the education side. Then you have to satisfy education or experience requirements. Uh, we have a minimum of two years of work experience required, which goes up if you have an uh, uh, associate's degree or an architecture degree. Um, that, were out, those hours must be documented and affirmed by a direct supervisor or a sponsor. That supervisor or sponsor can be another, a fellow NCIDQ certificate holder. It can be a someone who holds a title um, of a, a licensed design professional uh, at the state level. So it can be another New Jersey CID, or it can be a registered architect. Um, as long as they have direct supervision over you, I believe then that is, uh, they are eligible to be your sponsor. Now, I mentioned new work experience requirements. Prior to February 1st, uh, candidates are able to accumulate hours in any of this area, in any of these areas, but coming February 1st, 2024, Work experience must now touch all six of these buckets. We believe that the more explicit requirements open conversation and collaboration between candidates and employers to further support their growth as professionals and gaining a wide variety of experience and knowledge. And so all work experience must have been completed within the 10 year, prior 10 years to uh, applying for the exam and must be, uh, must be categorized in any of these six buckets, schematic design, contract administration, programming and pre-design, design development, construction documents, and professional practice. And there is a document on our website that goes into much more detail about what each of those buckets constitutes. Um, so again, these are comparable standards uh, to other design professions that have or experience requirements that must fulfill certain content areas. Now I'm gonna go into the application requirements a little bit. So there are two different types of applications. Those who are in the last year of their, uh, their programs and wish to take the IDFX while you're still in school, can take, can apply for the IDFX only, and then pay an application fee and submit for that section only, and then apply later for the IDPX and the practicum 
after completion of the FX and after completion of your work experience. If you don't want to do that, you can sign up, you can apply to take all or apply for all three sections at once. And you might, uh, to, but to, to do all, both of those applications, you have to request that your school email official transcripts or mail them directly to CIDQ um, and then pay the application fee or and fill out the uh, completed work verification form. Once transcripts are received by CIDQ, they'll be uploaded into your My NCIDQ account and you'll receive an email notification. Once an application has been reviewed, candidates will receive a status notification via email. And for those applying for the PX or practicum exam, the transcript, your, your official transcript must show that a degree has been awarded and the date that it was conferred. Now, CIDQ offers two exam administration windows in the spring and in the fall. Those occur during the months of April and October each year at Prometric test centers around the world. Then again, of course, with the IDFX and PX, you are now eligible to take them via remote proctoring from the comfort of your own home. However, you still do have to take them during either the months of April or October. And here you can see you know, exactly when the applications are accepted for those individual, uh, for each of those administration windows, when the payment and scheduling periods are, and of course, when the actual windows are. Be mindful of the application deadlines. If you're planning to take a win, uh, uh, exam in April, you have to apply for that exam no later than January 31st. If you're trying to take the exam in October, you have to apply for the exam by July 31st. Now fees. Uh, fees are according to the way that you apply to take the exam. Uh, if you are applying to take the IDFX only first and then applying later to take the PX and practicum, there are separate application fees for those, although they are, you know, because they're separate, the IDFX only is le fewer or less than the three sections together. Um, but you do have to pay an application fee for each application that you submit. And then there are accompanying exam fees with each of the individual sections. Now, it of course, it, this, you know, they're not cheap, but it is an investment in your professional career and your professional advancement. And so that is, it's definitely worth the investment. And again, a little bit more about the application or about the fees. Uh, we have the application fee, which is the fee paid to submit an application for review. Generally speaking, the application fee is a one-time fee and once approved, the application uh, is valid for uh, four exam administration windows if you take only the IDFX. So if you apply for the IDFX only, the, from the moment your application is approved, you have four exam administration windows or two years to take and pass the IDFX exam. If you then apply for the IDPX and practicum after taking the FX and passing it, once your application for the PX and practicum are approved, you have 10 exam administration windows or five years to complete that exam, to complete both of those two sections of the exam. So that is the, how the clock works if you apply for the IDFX only and the practicum and professional later. If you apply for all three exam sections at once, from the moment your application is approved, you have 10 exam administration windows, which is five years to pass, take and pass all three of those sections. If you are approved for an exam administration, or if you're approved for it, or your application is approved and that clock expires and you don't pass all three sections of the exam before that clock ends, 
then you have to go and pay another exam, uh, uh, an application fee to take the sections that you did not pass. And then of course there is the exam fee, which is the fee paid to purchase an exam for an accompany, upcoming exam administration. This paying this fee allows an approved applicant to schedule an exam appointment for that administration. So once you pay your exam fee, you're able to schedule your exam for any time through in within that month. And they are those fees are only valid for the current exam administration and do not carry forward. Again, exams are administered in April and October. There is a cancellation fee of $100 uh, uh, per exam. So approved applicants should not purchase an exam unless you intend to take it during the upcoming exam administration. Uh, if you have you know, already purchased the exam and you wish to defer to the next exam administration, that uh, cancellation fee does come into, uh, into play. Um, but you can reschedule an exam for the current administration only. And there are, I believe there is a smaller fee to do with that, um, like $80, I believe. Um, but again, yes, exams may only be rescheduled for another day within the current exam administration only. And there are rescheduling fees accompanying there. And uh, going back to studying for the exam, on our website, we list study groups available through ASID and IIDA chapters in addition to the exam blueprints. The exam blueprints show content that is actually being tested on the live exam. Candidates should always refer back to these regardless of what study materials you're using. All the study materials are uh, anything like study books, guides, materials, those are anything beyond this page are done by independent third parties with no association to CIDQ. This is the only CIDQ branded study resource that you will see. And I wanna take just a second to pull one of them up because that, it is so important that you take a look at them. I want you to go all to see what they, what they look like. And so again, you can see the pie chart here that outlines the content areas and the uh, ratio to how much each section is, is tested. I'll make it a little bigger for those uh, who, can, who want, want to see. And then of course, you can see down here, each content area is, shows the, the percentage of the exam that it constitutes, as well as what you need to demonstrate appropriate use and understanding of. So under programming and site analysis, you need to demonstrate appropriate use of analysis tools, demonstrate understanding of research methods, the site context, under relationship between human behavior and environment. You need to demonstrate an understanding of human factors, universal design, contextual influences. This breaks down in pretty helpful detail what you need to know in order to pass the exam. Everybody who takes the NCIDQ or is taking the NCIDQ should have access or should be using these regularly. Can't stress that enough. Okay, now moving on to scoring. Um, CIDQ provides IDFX and IDPS exams ta takers with preliminary score reports immediately following the completion of your exam appointment. Uh, final and official score reports, including those for the practicum exam, are released six to eight weeks after exam administration via your My NCIDQ account. But after you take the exam, you'll get this document, which will give you a sliding scale on the content areas listed in those blueprints and give you a better, a, a good sense of how you did on that on the exam. All three exams are graded on an 800 point scale with 800 being a perfect score. 500 is the passing point. And you can see that in each instance, a candidate receives feedback on each section of the exam so that you, you can assess your relative performance in a given area. So hopefully not, but if somebody needs to take the exam again, 
this will help you dem uh, focus your studying efforts and give you a good idea of where you need to brush up on for the next exam. Now, I wanna just briefly talk about jurisdictional regulation because all regulated jurisdictions in the US and uh, Canada, with the exception of California, require passage of the NCIDQ exam for certification, registration, or licensure. And in order to practice many types of interior design in regulated jurisdictions, and to be able to practice independently in, in, some, in some jurisdictions, you have to be registered, certified, or licensed in that state. Now, once you pass the NCIDQ exam, you'll see on this map, and many of you likely know, New Jersey is a regulated state. You have a title act. Now, you um, certificate, certificate holders should know that once you pass the NCIDQ exam and become NCIDQ certified, that does not automatically mean that you are registered and licensed with the state of New Jersey. You then have to take your NCIDQ certification and register separately with the state of New Jersey for the CID title. That is a very, very important thing for you to do as certificate holders in the state of New Jersey um, for reasons that Diane and, and uh, future uh, panelists will go into undoubtedly. But you know, it is critical to the uh, defensibility and uh, continue, you know, sustainment of the Title Act that NCIDQ certificate holders in New Jersey, as many as possible, take advantage of this opportunity that not, as you can see on this map, not all interior designers have. And so you want to ch ensure to check with the state of New Jersey as to the requirements for the type of interior design that you wish to practice and what their requirements may be for registration. And of course, um, since you're at this event here, you're familiar with the professional organizations. Many of, of them offer financial incentives to taking and passing the exam. Uh, my understanding is that ASID offers uh, the first year of professional membership free upon NCIDQ certification. I believe IIDA has the opportunity to apply for financial assistance for passing all three parts of the exam. Um, even IDC, the Interior Designers of Canada, offer a wide variety of scholarships and bursaries for NCIDQ exam candidates. So, uh, of course, these organizations are also very great resources for study groups, many of which I believe are on our website if you're looking for more information about that. Now, I want to finish out with, again, recapping why NCIDQ certification is important. It's important because you know it conveys professionalism. You know it tells people that you take your career seriously, that you're committed to advancing. It provides prestige, it, uh, the level of recognition within the, the interior design community and other allied professions who recognize the NCIDQ and the effort required in achieving professional certification. It provides you with the op with opportunity because it's a portable certification with job eligibility because many uh, jobs require NCIDQ certification. And just anecdotally, you know, looking around this room here with so many uh, folks, you know, becoming NCIDQ certified, uh, working hard for that rec recognition, um, it's a pretty nice group to be associated with. And so, you know, these, you know, you, you being NCIDQ certified makes you in many ways a leader uh, within your community, within your profession. And so I know that was a lot of information. Uh, here's all, all of our contact information, but I'll drop my email in the chat. I, I know that was a lot of information, but again, all of, all of it that I just spoke to is available on our website, available on the Canada Handbook. And of course, take a look at that handbook. Take a look at the blueprints. Those will be the two perhaps most useful resources that you are at your disposal uh, throughout your certification journey. Um, and with that, I will take any questions that anyone has about the exam. Thank you so much, Matt. I know that a lot of questions were going and I see that uh, Carrie Newman has done a very nice job of answering 
I think most of them, but Carrie, are there some questions that need to be fielded to Matt? If so, that are in the chat box. If so, why don't you go ahead and field those before we ask for live questions? So I did include a few links in the chat um, that answers directly to most of the questions. One question um, that I may not have totally hit the mark on was with the new work experience. So with these new requirements, are you allowed to double dip in the sense that if you're, if you're working in a firm and you have experience in both construction documents and design development, for example, can both of those hours um, apply to both categories? Yes, absolutely. You know, if you one, I mean, you all know very well that, you know, because one thing you're doing contract administration doesn't mean that you're not doing things like schematic design or pre many of the things that are required under each of these buckets satisfy, you know, multiple of the of the buckets concurrently. Right. So if you have one hour that's dedicated to design development, that doesn't mean that you can't also dedicate that hour to something like professional practice. Right. If it satisfies that bucket then it can satisfy multiple buckets, Does, if that makes any sense. Yes. Gary, do you think that that covered all the chat box? I do. Um, I included links for the others. So I'll just take them. Um... And there were so questions. What... There were questions on limits about how many times you can take the exam. But Matthew, I know you touched on those and I was able to um, include the link on that. I don't think that there is a limit to how many times you can take these. I guess, suppose there is personal con financial constraints to how many times you can take the exam if you fail it enough, right? But there is that clock wherein you, once you are, are approved for the application, you have two years to take the FX and you have five years to take the other sections. And if you apply for all three at once, then that five-year clock is how long you have to take to pass them all. Right. Um, all right. So if anyone did not get the chance to put a question in the chat box um, and you would like to ask a question live, uh, we'll we'll give, you know, you can do that right now. We'll give a minute and see if anybody wants to ask a question live um, that did not put something in the chat box. Um, I you mentioned that uh, the test is changed every five years. Um, I wanted to know if there was any way that we would know like what year this test is currently on or just, I don't know if you I, mentioned it just changed. I believe the last practice analysis was 2019 or 2020. It was fairly recently. It was recent. Okay. Yeah. Um, Diane, so, do yeah. you know for sure? It was very recent, wasn't it? Is it possible it's even more uh, recent than that, Matt, or not? I, I believe it was before 2020, but not that much before. It was either right. 2018 or 2019. 2019. It was, I think ah. it, was, it, was, it was pre COVID. That right. much I know. It was okay. definitely pre COVID. So I want to say 2019, so, but I will, is it, I will confirm that. And so, yes, yeah, so I think the next practice analysis coming up will be 2024. Yeah, that just helps gauge it with like the studying that goes into it, I yes. feel. But again, the practice analysis, which is a, you know, subject matter expert review of the professional competencies required for practice, it's more evolutionary than revolutionary. So changes yeah. to the exam will be incremental as opposed to wholesale changes. If right. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone else want to ask a question live? Thank you, Crystal. Uh, yes, I was wondering, the, can we talk about the difference between like having a direct supervisor and a sponsor to verify your work hours? Like what, how, what would be the spot? Like it's just someone that you know that is certified in your design? As, as long as they are a NCIDQ certificate holder, a licensed design professional in the state, or a registered architect then they don't necessarily have to be a direct supervisor, but they do have to be a licensed certified design professional that can 
see the work experience verification forms, know and understand the content that's there and be able to confidently sign off on it. Okay, understood. Thank you. Do you need to annually update your certification? You do. Um, and there are CEU requirements that are accompanied with that. But yes, there, I believe, is a nominal renewal fee as well as an attestation that you've satisfied. I believe it's five CEUs in health, safety, and welfare annually. Um, that information, again, is on the website. Uh, but yes, you do need to renew it annually in order to stay current and stay active and use the NCIDQ appellation. I have a question. Um, so we have to renew every year, uh, but you said that there's only two times a year that we can take the exam. That would be April or August, correct? April or October. October, okay. So if I get certified in April, um, do I take the next year's exam on April? Or can I take it in October? Does it, does, do you know what I mean? Does it run through that year or? So once your application is accepted, then you have that rolling clock that starts, right? So for argument's sake, let's just say you apply for all three sections at once. From the day that your application is approved, you have five years to pass all three sections of the exam. You can schedule those throughout any of the 10 exam administration windows throughout those five years at your own discretion. However you want to schedule your exam, however works for you, within those five years, within those 10 exam administration windows, then you're at your liberty to schedule them. Once you pass all three exam sections and you become NCIDQ certified and you can use the NCIDQ appellation after your name, that is when the annual renewal requirements kick in. And that is when you have to pay the renewal fee to CIDQ along with your CEU continuing education unit at a station in order to remain active and continue to use the NCIDQ appellation. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. All but right. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask if you if you're not active. Uh, let's say you're, I guess it, it expires. You have to take the test again. No, you do not. But you will have to pay a reinstatement fee. And I believe submit again, those C, that CEU attestation that you have enough CEUs to be able to return to active status. But no, you, if you let your certification lapse into inactivity, you do not have to take the exam again but you will have to reinstate your certification. And if you, once you're inactive, you cannot legally use the NCIDQ appellation because then you haven't attested to the continuing education that is required of that. Right, okay, thank you. I have another question. Uh, the NCIDQ website has a, uh, it's a button that has, it's like an account. Do we have to create an account if we're just, okay. If, if you want to apply for the exam, you have to create an, a MyNCIDQ account. Creating mm -hmm. a MyNCIDQ account doesn't mandate you to apply for the exam, but if you want to apply for the exam, you have to create a MyNCIDQ account. Got it, thank you. All right, thank you all. Um, Matt, thank you so much for the fantastic presentation. It was so, for us to be able to even bring CIDQ uh, to this many people at one time is a fantastic thing. So uh, thanks to Diane for making sure this happens every year. It's just, it's pretty special, I have to say. Thank you, Matt, for such a generous amount of time and the thorough presentation. Matt has also generously put his email um, in the chat box, I see. So. Any of you, I mean, I will say that the wonderful people who work at CIDQ are so open to communicating with those who are preparing to take the exam. So he really does mean contact him when he puts his email in there. He's not just doing that um, because he feels he has to. Absolutely. Um, Thank you so much, it. Jeffrey. And before I Thank go, you, Matt. anybody, of course, if you have questions, contact us. But 
if you, most of your questions should be able to be answered by the candidate handbook and the, the uh, exam blueprints. Take a look at those, can't stress that enough. Thank you all very much and good luck. Thank you so much, Matt. And now we turn it over to MJ DeVino to talk about his experience um, as someone who has taken the exam and uh, all of that that goes along with that. So MJ, it's now yours. Uh, thanks, Jeffrey. Hi, everybody. So good to see your names on the screen. Um, <laughs> so I guess I'll start off by saying that um, when I took the last part of the NCIDQ, which was October of 2022, that was one month before my 50th birthday. So if any of you guys are stressing about when to take it or should I take it or blah, 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 you got to do it when it's right for you. <laughs> so um, I'm sure most of you know that I, I have an architecture license and I recently passed the NCIDQ, but uh, doing the architecture exams uh, really helped prepare me for the NCIDQ as well, because um, you know the with the latest versions of both exams, um, they're made by the same people. So I got to see what the format of the NCIDQ was because of the, it's called the ARE, the Architectural Registration Exam. And um, I really started taking the architecture exams back in 2001. Uh, so my journey <laughs> is, was uh, quite a long one. And for my, my students specifically, if you wanna hear this, I failed more sections than I passed between the, the two kinds of exam between the architecture exam and the interior design exam, I actually failed more sections than I passed um, because it's that whole thing. I'm I'm not a good test taker. I have high anxiety, and when you go into these test centers to to do these things, it's it's not the most uh, welcoming place. You know the the they never used an interior designer to design the test centers. <laughs> that's that, that these places are sent in. They, they're like hospitals and they make you feel like, uh, I don't know, it's, just, it's, it's awful. And you know, the number of times that I had to go into these test centers. Um, and you know, the, the, the very last test that I took, the one in October of 2022, what I had decided was I have had enough of the test center that I kept going to. I decided I was gonna do one in the city in Manhattan. And so the night before I booked a hotel and I just shut myself off from the rest of the world. And that was the best thing I could have ever done because it just got me into the whole mindset of all I care about is passing this test today or you know these, these, these uh, two days. Um, and I actually went through the testing process twice. So most people don't know that um, I've had two stints at Kane. I'm in my second stint at Kane. The first one was 2008 to 2011. And so in 2011, I took the NCIDQ for the first time. Now that was back when you actually had to bring a drafting board to a test center with your drafting tools and everything. And you had to physically draw a design solution on paper. It was in this, you go to this hotel, which has, you know, big convention center. There's a bunch of tables. I think there were about uh, 200 people taking the test at the same time as me. And it, it was, you know, if I had anxiety about the test centers now, you can imagine what it was like um, back then. And even the, uh, when I took my test, the practicum um, in 2011, there was another test taker who, um, the time finished and she didn't finish, but she just kept drawing. And so the administrators had to come over there and tell her to stop. And she didn't, she kept going. And it was the whole thing. She started crying. She started throwing things around. They, they literally had to get security, lift her out of her chair and take her out of the test center. It was the strangest thing I had ever seen. Um, but for the NC for the NCIDQ, both times I took it, I passed the uh, multiple choice sections first try, 
Uh, but it, um, it always took me several tries to do the uh, practicum. Um, so, you know, there's there's a couple of strategies around that. Some people like to space them out. So one test, um, test administration, they'll do one exam, and then six months later, they'll do another one. Um, I was I was not of that because I don't like to study. So I decided to take all three sections at the same time. Um, so I took all three of them in April of, no, sorry, October of 2021 passed the two multiple choice and failed the practicum. And then, so I retook the practicum in the spring of 2022 and failed that one. And then that one last time in October of 2022, I finally uh, passed the practicum. Now, I'm not sure if you guys caught what, um, uh, I already forgot the guy's name uh, before me said, but um, for the multiple choice, you find out your results right away. As soon as you hit submit, um, in the test time, you find out right away. But for the practicum, they make you wait three months to find out if you pass or not. And I tell you, those three months are terrible. <laughs> um, and luckily, you know, they, for if you take it in October, the results come right before Christmas. So you're either getting a Christmas gift or you're getting the worst news ever um, at, at Christmas time. <laughs> um, but so the reason why I um, asked to be one of the people that uh, talked tonight was I wanted to answer the question of why should I take the NCIDQ, which I, I don't really think was addressed by the CIDQ people um, because, you know, they're, they're just assuming that you want to take it. But there's, you know, there's a lot of theories behind why you should take it. Uh, but to me, the, the real reason is legitimacy. Uh, it's legitimacy, it's accomplishment, but it's also something that you're not going to hear a lot. I think you should take the NCIDQ because the interior design industry needs warriors, right? How many times have you ever heard that? So quick quiz. How many people know how many certified interior designers New Jersey has? Less than 200, is it? No, a little bit more than that. It's around, it's around 400. How many people know how many registered architects there are in New Jersey? Is it 700? No. Oh, seven, I remember, I remember seven, you asked us this before. 7,000. Oh, I just needed one more zero. <laughs> 7,000 architects versus 400 designers. Now, I say the word versus specifically. Architects do not like interior designers. They have, if we have a stigma against us, it is not because the architects help us out. If you remember that map that he showed about who has licensing rights, New Jersey is probably one of the last states that will ever let interior designers have the right to sign off on drawings. And that is so, so horrible, I can't even tell you. In order for interior designers to get legitimacy, we first of all need more certified interior designers, and then we have to stand up to all the architects, okay? It's the architects who are preventing us from being able to do what they do, and we know how to do what they do. I've seen both sides of the fight, but we have to stand up for ourselves. Right? We have to, as a group, come to the table and say, no, I can do the same thing that an architect can do. I should have the right to sign off on drawings just as much as an architect. Now, of course, the architects are trying to save their jobs. Um, but quite honestly, it's not, it's not fair. It's not, a, it's not a fair fight. Right Now, you think about those numbers, 407,000 again, of course, what percentage of that 400 is women for designers? And what percentage of those 7,000 is men? Okay, so the, the battle for this is so skewed on so many levels, but the, the first step in overcoming that, that struggle is to get licensed or is to get certified. Now, there aren't 
you know, we're not going to be able to solve that problem instantly. You know, even if everybody that's in design school right now gets their, their license, we still will only, we won't even be in 500 or 600, but it has to start somewhere. And then other designers hear about that, you know, yeah, maybe I should get my license too. And it just, it grows and it grows and it grows. They tell two friends and they tell two friends and so on and so on and so on. Um, but it has to start somewhere. And it also has to start with people getting upset about this. We can't just, we can't keep being complacent about it and letting that, oh, that's just the way things are. No, you have to fight. If you've ever heard the term advocacy, that is something that, you know, I would really like to start getting more involved in. And I think everybody else should to get more involved. And advocacy is that fight about giving designers the right to have more participation in the building process, right? So no, you can't build a building and you don't go to school to do things like structure and whatever, but those are really the only two differences. Um, I've talked to my students a lot about this, that if you compare what we do in our, in our interior design program versus what our own Kane interior um, architecture program does, my students can build a building better than an architecture student can. And that carries into the real world. Real designers know pretty much just about the same thing that um, architects do. And I would even say even more so because what we care about is the experience of using the building as opposed to the building just being an object or a, a, a piece of artwork or something like that. We care about how the building is used and who uses our buildings. It's, it's, a, it's a completely different way of thinking, but it's a completely legitimate way of thinking, but not enough people have put their foot down about it being a legitimate way of thinking uh, for any action to have really happened. Um, can I mention something, um, MJ? Um, that 400 are CID certified interior designers, not just NCIDQ certificate holders. So you have to go the level above and apply to the state and apply to the, to the uh, interior design committee to get approved to be one of those more than 400, maybe five, 600, 700 people, 800 people, hopefully very soon. <laughs> the more that number increases, the more the AIA and the architects will, um, will sign up with us. The Board of Architects is very interested in having more qualified interior designers. Let me tell you, it's the profession itself, the AIA and those like them, that really need to have their minds changed. Just say. Okay. Yep. MJ, are you taking questions? Absolutely. Yes, good. I didn't see, um, I see some uh, go MJ, preach MJ comments, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but any questions for MJ um, about the test taking experience, about uh, anything that he I'll ask a question, about? Jeffrey. Yeah, go ahead. Um, since you said you don't like studying MJ, what were some of your study like tips or habits that you might recommend? Oh, here's the best study tip I can give to anybody and everybody. Listen, if you are in a good job and you go to a good school, you're already being told the answers to the questions on the exam. So if you're listening and you're recording and you're retaining all of this information, there's actually very little that you have to study. Um, now, what I did was um, I did uh, Q, this thing called Q practice, which was from the Diane's, I, Diane's going to talk about that tonight. Okay. Yes. IIDA. And um, um, I think the thing that worked the best for me was just taking practice exam after practice exam. And then what you do with those is you take the results and the things that you got wrong, that's where you can go in and then hone in on the parts of the book that you need to study. Um, I use the uh, Kent Ballast book for uh, the, the written material. Um, so that's my, my suggestion is you practice plus the Ballast book 
um, as the only really study tools that you need. Uh, but like I said, just having listened to your bosses and supervisors and God forbid your professors is, you know, I, I honestly believe that you can get 50% on that test just by common sense, just by reading the questions and thinking, you know, of, of everything I've already learned, even if you're just a student, of everything I've ever learned, what would I answer to this? I mean, that's the thing about multiple choice is that you you already have 25% chance of getting it right. Um, so I, I, I say that because I don't, I don't want anybody to put extra pressure on themselves just because it's an exam, right? We're so, we're so deluded that, you know, exam is the end all be all of existence or whatever. And like I said, you know, I failed a couple, so what? I mean, so yeah, it costs some money. Those, right? exams, those exams that you didn't pass, what do you think was kind of holding you back? Or where do you feel that you struggled? Well, according to the um, score chart, it was codes, <laughs> which is crazy because I'm a freaking architect. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know. And that's, you know, they, they tell you what category that you are weak in or strong in but they don't tell you specifically what about those categories to, to focus on. So it's just like, okay, I got to go back and reread the whole code section of, of the book. But yeah, I'll, I'll say that every time I failed a test, the next time I took it, I always scored higher. So I always knew it's just that, just take it the, num the right number of times and eventually <laughs> you'll get there. That's what I'll never forget when Kia Weatherspoon was our keynote presenter Oh, right, right. Two, two, two years ago? Two years ago. Um, Kia was very honest about her journey with the NCIDQ and how many times she took it. And she's on the board of CIDQ today, <laughs> you know? And she said that there, she knew she was getting better with each time. And then finally that day came, like that good moment you had in December when you were parading <laughs> down the halls of Kane, um, happy as can be, right? And she had that moment and it was a really major moment because she was, she, she just kept going. Alice, we want to hear your journey. Thank you, MJ, so very much. Thank you for empowering all of that are here tonight. And uh, now Alice Musso kutard Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. And I cannot say it enough. I, I mean, we need angry people, right? We need angry people to get to stand up for our profession, right? Because how many of you have said to like people that don't know the field, right? Like, oh, I'm an interior designer, or I, I want to be an interior designer. And they look at you like, oh, like the stuff we see on TV, like AGTV and stuff, like you want to decorate like you want to pick paints and stuff. So that's not what we do. Our breadth of knowledge is so much greater. And, um, you know, by being a certified interior designer through the NCIDQ, that's really what we're putting out there in the world, right? We're, we're telling people we know what we're talking about. We're experts in the field and we deserve um, the right to practice the way that, you know, the way that we, we want to, right? Um, so, for me, that was really like the 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 push, let's say, in the field, and what why I wanted to get um, certified, and also to tell people, um, you know, both our clients and um, you know people in the field, I wanted them to know that I was the expert, that I knew my stuff, and um, and it's also reassuring too because I mean I work in commercial interiors, um, and I do a lot of different stuff. You know, I do. Um, building repositioning, workplace, pharma and lab sciences, multi-tenant spaces from, you know, smaller to all the way to very large um, projects. So we get to collaborate with a lot of different people and to get on those calls with hundreds of people and they're all more knowledgeable than you, but you need to know your stuff. You need to be able to defend your ideas um, and to say, no, I actually think we can do this if we do that, right? So being able to stand up for your ideas is a really big part of interior design. And I think that's what it gave me. It gave me a sense of confidence going through the NCIDQ because I knew my stuff. 
and it showed, um, you know, like entering, entering meetings and being like, no, 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 you're not going to draw circles around me and thinking that, you know, uh, telling me that you can't move this, this duct because I know we can move this duct. So, um, and, and it really showed and we, we collaborated and we, we created some amazing projects um, through that. And it was really a, that confidence kind of came um, through with the NCIDQ process. And, um, you know, a little bit about like, obviously we want legitimacy and, and that's, that's the whole point of the exams in my point of view as well. Um, so really, really important to do that. And then in regards to the exams themselves and what I did to take the exam. So I actually took them um, and passed the first time. So I don't have like a, a, um, a story behind like getting over, um, you know, potential failure, but I did prepare myself for failure because I was like, you know what, it is just an exam. We can pass it again. <laughs> I can do this again. It's not, it's not a big deal. And I told no one. I told no one about it because I didn't want to be, you know, to tell everybody like passing in the exams and I'm really excited. And then to come to the day of and it didn't pass and then having to explain to people, especially peers, um, oh, I didn't pass and I'm really sad about it and I don't want your opinions. <laughs> so I kind of took it back and I didn't tell anybody. Obviously they all found out anyway because I was really stressed out and I think I let it slip at some point and then it spread like wildfire. So <laughs> everybody knew and everybody was awaiting my results. And, and it was kind of nice because they were all cheering me on. And the day that I received the email, because you do get an email for the practicum exam, um, considering, you know, what MG just said, you know, you get the exams right away when you pass the um, IDFX and IDPX before the prac, you have to wait three months, right? So. Um, when you finally get that email that says, yes, you've passed, you're a certified interior designer, it is just so overwhelming with joy. I was in the middle of a meeting and I had to pause and to say, I'm sorry, I'll be right back. And I was screaming, my, my hands were up in the air. It's essentially like, you know, it's like passing the bar of interior design. So um, I was extremely happy and it's something that I hope that all of you get to experience because it's something that's just wonderful to um to, to experience really. Um, but in terms of the exams themselves, so a little bit of a hot take here, but my number one tip would be to not pass it right out of school. And I know it's it's a really hot take, but, but hear me out here. Um, I'm a person that also doesn't like to study and I like to have everything kind of study once, get them all done and be done with it. So um, that's the way that I did it. And I think it worked really well because I studied once, I studied for a very long period of time and, um, and then I passed them all. And um, you know, the thing is in your first years of working, a lot of knowledge is getting thrown at you. You're, you're getting constant things to do, all nighters and getting to study at the same time is probably overwhelming. I see a lot of my juniors that are kind of going through it and they all kind of came in thinking they were gonna have time to study and they're all kind of falling behind their study schedules. And I essentially told them because I am um, my this, um, leader and champion in terms of um, certification for interior design. Um, I told them just take a pause, take a break. There's always time, there's always time to study. And I know we say, better get it done faster rather than later because life happens and things happen and then you don't want to get left behind. And I completely understand that, but I think you need to be um, kind to yourself and know yourself and know what you can handle. If you can handle having a really big kind of um, first year's experience and study at the same time, that's great. More power to you. Go for it. But I would say if it's going to stress you out, if because there's a lot of things that you're learning as a junior, you're learning how the firm is functioning, you're learning how the field is functioning, you're, you're new to all of those things. And, and it's very different from, from school. And school prepares you really well for it. Uh, but it's, it's still an adjustment and still really a lot of knowledge gets thrown at you. So I would say take a, you know, take a break for a couple of years, gather your um, hours, and then when you're really ready, go and pass the exams. And then, um, you know, a couple of tips that I have is 
know your code. <laughs> the building code is a huge portion of the exams. All three exams will have code questions in them in one way or another. So know your code by heart. Um, and by that, I don't mean like know everything that's written down, don't know. But know the things that come up regularly, right? In the, in the test questions, I also prepared with um, Q practice. And it was really amazing. I mean, I could go on for hours about that, but um, know your code is no, number one, and then apply what you learn. So if you're learning something, right, and I uh, bought all the books, right, there, I think there were three books that were um, kind of the number one books that everybody were using. So I was like, okay, I'm going to buy them all. And I read them cover to cover, but that was just my style of studying. I just really needed to to read everything so i read everything and then whatever i was learning that day or that week i was applying them to the projects that i was working on and if it was um i remember this like the av um we were doing some av coordination for um and and, and distances right and readable readability of of screens and distances and I read through that entire section and then I would go back to my projects and thankfully I could apply that knowledge. Really applying it will make you remember it because you'll be like, oh, well, that makes sense because of that. So definitely try to apply as much knowledge as possible. So it's not just knowledge that's kind of floating in your head. It's knowledge that you're applying to um, the things that you're dealing with every single day. Um, and a lot of things too are gonna, you're gonna see when you get in the field and, and when you're working in that every day, you're gonna see that those things come up. And a lot of that knowledge will kind of start rolling in for you. Um, then tip, tip number three would be ask the experts. So if you're not sure about something, right? You're reading something and you're like, I don't, I don't understand. I don't, this doesn't make any sense um, at all go to the people that will know the answer, right? So if it's, um, you know, your professors at, um, at university, or um, if it's, you know, if you're working at a firm, go to somebody that is certified already in the office that can answer your questions, or, you know, uh, an architect that you're working with on a project, or another designer, whoever, you think that will be better suited to answer your questions, go to them because you'll get a much better understanding instead of trying, instead of like sitting at your desk, like just scratching your head, like I don't understand and I'm trying to and you're Googling so many things and potentially getting it wrong, right? Go to the experts. So that's tip number three. And then tip number four would be create a real realistic schedule. Now, this is going back to being kind to yourself and being realistic to um, what you can really handle, right? So I passed the NCADQ in October and um, it took me six months. So I, I, spread, I spread my schedule up to six months so that I would be, wouldn't be too stressed, right, about it because having a full-time job and then studying on top of it, it's a lot of, it's a lot, it's just a lot. So be really kind to yourself and be realistic. For me personally, um, I did a study schedule that was one week. I did a mod I did a module per week, essentially, so that um, when I was studying, I could apply it. I could reach out to people for specific questions and I could really spread it so that I knew what I was doing. And then the last month, right before the exams, um, what I did is I did only uh, quizzes quizzes, 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 and practice exams so that I would be really ready to kind of jump in. And um, I would say that tip number five, I think we're at five now. <laughs> tip number five would be that when you're taking the exam, take a breath, don't overcomplicate things, just come in and, sit and just read the question as it is. Don't try to like read into it as much as possible and flag questions so that you can go back to them because there's always, I always hear people that are running out of time. And if you're that kind of person that you need to, and I'm dyslexic, right? I'm dyslexic, so I take a lot of time to read through things. So what I did is I flagged questions 
And then I would come back to them at the end, just so that if, if ever I had run out of time, at least I would have answered the questions that you just know on top of your head, you just know them. So flag the questions, really, really important. And remember that you know your stuff. You've studied for so long, you know your stuff. Get to the exam, peace of mind, you know your stuff. Let it, just let it go. Let the feeling go. Just sit at, at the desk and, and do the exam because you are the expert. You've studied, you know the material now, be confident about it. So that, that would be my kind of, my interpretation of um, taking the taking the test, and I think I mean it's it's always it's always a hard thing, and it's always easier to say than to do. Um, but I would say be be kind to yourself and just just take it easy. And it's okay to fail. I think preparing yourself to fail is a really good um, thing to do. And remembering that you can take the exams um, as many times as as you need to, and that it's okay if you do. So. Just be calm, <laughs> just be calm and try to do your best and it, it will be okay. It will be okay even if you fail. So that would be number one kind of um, tip for me. But I think, I think that's essentially all I wanted to um, cover here. I'm going to go back to my notes here. That but was wonderful, yeah. Alice. It was fantastic. And I I'm hoping, I know MJ has put some really interesting and important links in the chat. Um, so everyone make sure you see those. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask live um, of Alice? Yes, I do. Alice, yes. what's yes. your Go next ahead, step? Diane. So my next step is to get CID. So I'm applying. So um, there's a few little things that you have to do, right? You have to get um, some sponsors to um, to write some letters and stuff like that. So I'm doing that right now. I got the approvals from everybody I needed approval from. So I am becoming CID, hopefully. <laughs> did you both, MJ and, and Alice, did, I know MJ took it in October. Did you also, was October your, this past October when you took it or was it last spring? For me, it was this past October. Okay, so y'all took it at y'all took it at the same uh, time. Okay, mm -hmm. um, Diane, I I don't think you could have had a better right. introduction to the importance of Q practice. I mean, I think <laughs> that it, between MJ and Alice, both really, and I will say that I've had former students who have all who also sing the praises of doing the practice exams of how important it is. And I also, I just wanted to follow up on something Alice said about the part about be kind to yourself. Yeah. I have a former right. student who um, passed one part um, on the first time and then did not, and then has failed um, one of the parts twice. And when I last talked to her, she said, I realized that I had been putting so much pressure on myself that I wasn't giving myself space for anything else in my life. And so I'm going to sit it out for one year and then and regroup and then look at it from a different perspective uh, when I go back to town. And I thought that was so mature to realize that she had just been piling this pressure um, on herself and creating the anxiety. So thank you for telling everyone here to be kind to yourself over it. Um, Diane, let's turn it over to you for our sure. final segment, which is on the all important CID process and Q prep. Right, so just a little help on the Q practice. The ASID has a scholarship program for five very lucky designers who want to study in Q practice. And um, the program will start in July and will go through October. Um, and they will pay the monthly fee for Q practice for five people. So if you're interested in doing that, um, the uh, NA, the New Jersey ASID Administrator Center, your center your request to do that, and she will send you the information that you'll need to apply for that scholarship. So there are five lucky people that could get the Q practice. Um, and one of the important things about the Q practice is when you take those quizzes, they have an answer vault. So if you get the mistake, you don't know what it is you got, why you got that wrong. The answer vault will help you. It's a really cool thing. 
So Q practice is really a, a fabulous way to do this. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is that the word certificate is important to know. The NCIDQ is the third E, education, experience, and examination. All right, that's the third E. You need all three to become a New Jersey CID and get your registration number, right? So it's the qualifying exam. It's what will get us legitimacy if you if we have more CID people in the state of New Jersey. It is the highest level um, in the state for an interior designer's qualification. It makes you a closely allied professional is what MJ was talking about before. You know, we know a lot of the same materials and we can do a lot of the same work, but we don't have that legitimacy. And we are getting that if we pursue being becoming a state certified interior designer, knowing the health, safety and welfare as being primary for um, that certification. So you have an NCID certificate, you are a certificate holder, but you're not really a certified interior designer until you receive the state certification. Now it's a protected title. It doesn't stop anybody from doing design or decorating or whatever they want to call it, but it is a protected title and it is um, highly, it is so highly qualified that we have a position on the State Board of Architects, interior designers, so they understand the importance and the, um, the knowledge that we have gathered. Do you have any questions there? The yeah, any application, how do you do topic. that? Say that again. Yeah, any questions for Diane, everyone can put them in the chat box and Carrie can field them to Diane or you can ask live as well. Just note that because it's such a it's such an important topic that you understand what Diane is uh, talking about. There is a, a committee when you sign in, you get your application, you apply to be a CID. There's an interior design examination and evaluation committee that will read through your application, understand it, understand your work. And um, and there you go. You become a New Jersey CID. Any questions? Diane, I actually do have a question because I'm so intrigued by the number um, that we, you, you and MJ were in conversation mm -hmm. about earlier. And so it sounds like for some reason there's Alice is on the right track because she's 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 um. She's done the first part by passing the NCIDQ and now she's going through the process to become CID, CID. But it sounds like there are a lot of designers who pass the NCIDQ who don't go on to get uh, the I process. don't know why. And I don't know why. Yeah, what's the, what do you think the roadblock is? is I think they think like they have a certificate, but they don't realize oh. the importance of going and getting the state certification for that. That, that makes you almost, the closely that allied like advocacy. It sounds like an advocacy um, opportunity, big time, to have uh, you know that network that they would want to become uh, CID because then they are stronger with advocacy. It the just, ASID is trying to to get that across. The coalition is no longer in existence, so it takes people in the IIDA and the ASID to get together to really emphasize taking it up to the next level. And it's not not that wow. hard. You make an application, right? And uh, right. and you get your your materials and you present them, and that's that's how you do it. Wow. Um, one other topic that Diane, um, I'm hoping one day is going to do a program about that is is the topic around legislation um, around the country and and how even though Diane and the coalition. And the New York coalitions were all, you know, really battling in the 1990s, 80s and 90s. No, it 90s, is still 90s, a battle 90s. in 90s. It is still a battle in some states today in, in 2023. And there are states that are having, um, uh, you know, conversations around these major topics. And ASID, if you follow, if you're a member of ASID and you follow ASID's website in the email blast, you'll read about the legislation 
um, challenges, because that's another big, big, big topic that we'll save for another program, but it really ought to be a program at some point. Lauren Early is already, we're preparing for that program, Jeff. Lauren Early Yay, from ASID Advocacy. It's a fascinating, advocacy it's a fascinating and topic. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really fascinating topic. Okay, I want to give the whole audience another chance to ask questions. Um, so because you have got MJ still here, Alice still here, and Diane still here. So let's just a couple of minutes and, and we'll we'll say for questions that anyone wants to ask uh, live. I'll ask a question. Um, Alice, I wanted to know where you went to school and how many years after you graduated is when you finally took the first part of the exam. Sure, absolutely. So I actually graduated with a BFA um, from Humber College in Toronto. And um, I have gradu I graduated almost five years. So it's going to be five years in May, um, five years ago. <laughs> so I took my NCIDQ four years into it. And I think it was the right move for, for me specifically, just because, again, there's a there's a lot of knowledge that gets thrown at you. And I was kind of, I was buried. And I was one of those um, people that were like, oh, I'm going to take the NCADQ right out of school. And I did not have the time. But um, I, I, I was kind of, I got, I got hired um, at Gensler right out of school. So I got thrown in the deep end um, right out of school. So it was, it was a lot, but um, I think I did it at the right time um, for me specifically, but everybody's journey is different and everybody knows themselves differently. I knew that I couldn't handle the stress of, of two things at once. So I, I preferred to wait. All right, any other questions? I have a question question, I guess, more to the open discussion. Um, what was the driving factors for why you wanted to take the NCIDQ exam? And what was the, I guess, biggest benefit after passing the NCIDQ, like professionally and with your experience? Alice, you want to take that? Sure, I can take that. Um, so I think, you know, I've spoke about legitimacy as well. So I think that was the number one thing. It, it was to set up in meetings and that, you know, tell people I knew my stuff. And I think it, it's a really big thing because you're kind of transitioning when you pass your NCIDQ, you're transitioning from junior level to intermediate to potential senior um, position you, because you you have that knowledge and because you you can really back yourself up it, it, it's a huge it's a huge jump so you know what you're doing they they trust you a lot more with what you're doing you're you're in charge of projects a lot more so I, I would say that that was my biggest um, driver and to be able to tell people that I was an interior designer, because that was, that's a huge thing too. It, it's a protected title, like Diane said. And, you know, you want to be able to tell people like, hey, I'm an interior designer. Like I, I did it. I did it. It's a huge thing. So um, having that and also, you know, you, you want to be able to when you tell people that you're an interior designer at some point, right? We're gonna get there, people. We're, that's what I believe. We're gonna get there. We're gonna get to the point where when you tell people you're an interior designer, they think of the same thing that you actually do. Because right now you tell people you're an interior designer and they think you're an interior decorator. There's a bit of a, a problem there, right? So at some point, and we're gonna try our best, and that's the whole point of this, this entire generation, all of you on the call that are going to be certified interior designers, it's all, all of us. All of us are gonna push the profession forward and we're gonna tell people what we actually do because how, are they supposed to know what we do if we don't tell them what we do? So I, that was also something that really brought me to, to, you know, to want that certification. It was that first step because I knew what I wanted to do and it wasn't just, you know, a hobby. It wasn't just, it, it was a real profession. And at the end of the day too, um, I think, you know, some people, even, even in, at my level, like some people, decide not to take their certification um, exams because they think, oh, well, I'm in a firm. So anyway, it's a certain, the firm's reputation. 
One, some firms may actually require you to take your NCIDQ at some point in your career. And two, what if you decide to leave that firm? You're against a lot of different designers that are going to be certified. And also if you decide to um, open your own company, you're, you're gonna have a lot more um, trust in yourself and a lot more companies are gonna wanna work with you if you have that certification to back yourself up. Um, so it's essentially, you know, you, you can't practice medicine without, <laughs> without having a, a doctorate. And it's, even though it's very different, it's the same kind of thing, right? You, 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 you wouldn't want to do something if you're not sure about how to do it. So this is kind of telling people, I know what I'm doing. Um, so that was one. And then two, I think it was, um, you know, it, it really, it helped tremendously in terms of trust in the teams professionally. A lot of people um, in my teams, I kind of, you know, I, I moved status um, and I was in charge of projects. Now I'm a project interior designer and, um, you know, that could not have happened otherwise if um, I wasn't a certified interior designer. All right, MJ, there's a question in the chat box that I would love for you to take because I think it's quite fitting that you as the director of, of, uh -huh. uh, of the program take it you'll see it's in the chat box um i want to close the night just recognizing um that we want to say a tremendous thank you to matt barish diane gote mj divino and alice brusso coutard these are names that you do not want to forget you want to know those four names um uh in your professional journey we appreciate their time so much i also want to recognize that we have a couple of board members in attendance tonight and also um some of the planning committee that has put this week together so i'd like to recognize julia giovanelli uh who is on the screen julia for all of you who are student members of asid julia is the student rep to the board which means that she really is your liaison between between you and the board, she is here for you. So if you go to Kane and you know Julia, remember that she is the student rep to the board and is someone that you should talk to about anything about ASID. And for those of you at Berkeley and NJIT in Brookdale, she's there for you as well. Um, Carrie Newman uh, is the chair of the Emerging Professionals Committee and the Emerging Professionals are those in the first five years of their career. So um, it's important that once you are no longer a student, that you stay active in the organization as an emerging professional um, and attend uh, events and carries on the committee for this week. Reina Dominguez is here tonight. There she is. Wave for us, Reina. Reina is an ASID New Jersey board member. Uh, she's the communications uh, director for ASID New Jersey's board. Also in the room where I am sitting right now, if you come to the uh, Saturday program, uh, from 10 to 12, Raina is one of the presenters who will be have a table um, like the one where I'm sitting at right now, where she will be talking about Sherwin Williams, where she works, but then she's also going to make a presentation um, to the audience as well. So you will actually can meet Raina in person on Saturday. Nada had to jump off, but our, that is our president. And I'd like to say Mariam Abdel Hamid, uh, if Mariam is on the call, Mariam is also on the committee uh, that has been planning ASI New Jersey Student and Emerging Professionals Week. It's a team effort, and we are so happy to be able to do it um, every year. The final words I want to say are, I'm quoting Diane Gote because I think that I just want to repeat the language that was on the graphic for, for the program this year. It supports what both MJ and Alice said about why they've recently uh, pursued the exam and passing it. As Diane wrote, passing the NCID exam and becoming a state certified interior designer fully demonstrates verifiable, and she had us bullet uh, uh, highlight that bold, that word, verifiable skills to practice interior design. And uh, that's what I hope you all walk away from tonight thinking about and your journey. So we will say good night. Uh, unless Diane has any closing words, Diane, would you like to say anything? No, it's the, the best thing you could possibly do for you and your career to pass the NCIDQ and then become a New Jersey yeah. CID. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. Have a great night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.